as a standard operation. It's about uh, how to detect uh, the topological properties of, of uh, band structure of photonic systems with using deep learning. So, Vittorio, please, uh, the, 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 the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's really a pleasure. Um, so, in um, maybe I start with some <laughs> advertisement of the of the institute. Uh, okay, you already mentioned it. I'm at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light, uh, and uh, in the TO division, uh, led by Florian Marquard, and we are in the, in Erlanger, in, in, in the north of, of Bavaria. Uh, so it's a pretty nice place. We are always looking for postdoc and PhD students. So um, I hope somebody is interested. Uh, so in the last uh, couple, of, I mean, for the Institute, more like in the last four years, for myself personally, more two years, we have uh, um, focused a lot on uh, working in machine learning, uh, applied to any kind of uh, physical system. And as Dario already mentioned, Today, it's just, a, I'm going to talk, uh, focus up about a special aspect of uh, it, uh, and in particular to use uh, neural network to predict band structures. It's a work in collaboration with a master's student, Florian Zappa and uh, Florian Marquard. I start with uh, some very basic introduction uh, because I don't know exactly what is the background of the, of the audience. As I hope it's not too <laughs> basic. Okay, let's start. So um, basically the, uh, about deep neural networks. So uh, uh, deep neural networks are basically um, inspired by, by the uh, functioning of our brain. So if you want to think of our brain in the most simple set, setting, you can think it as a device that uh, process information. So it, it takes an input, for instance, it could be an, an image and uh, it output uh, and, uh, action and uh, so for example uh, a simple example of this is image recognition uh, so if we uh, see an image of a of a light bulb within uh, um, so very quickly we, we we are able to recognize it uh, and uh, the amazing part of this is that this works even for uh, images that we have never seen it so the shape uh, is not, so we have this abstraction uh, capability. So the shape is not important. It's not important from which uh, angle the image is shown. We are always able to, 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 to perform this task. It's extremely simple for us. But if you think uh, for a moment, uh, it's actually, it's really quite an art task. So it, it would be really impossible to our code it, to write a program uh, that is able to uh, to recognize any any light bulbs, and also like our brain is extremely flexible, uh, uh, we can uh, recognize any type of objects, and so it's clearly something that you cannot R code. Uh, and so this has inspired people to develop uh, neural networks, and the idea behind neural network is very simple. So it's some kind of nonlinear function which has very simple, uh, the, the function itself is very complicated, but it has simple building blocks that are referred to as neuron, like in our brain, and they are really highly uh, connected. And uh, the key feature that it share with our brain is that it's trainable. So there is um, a procedure, an algorithm that allow to uh, learn the free parameter uh, of this function. So this is the key um, and so it works like this. I do not code the program, but I basically show it me thousands or even millions of uh, images and they are annotated. And then little by little, I can learn the parameter and can make uh, more and more accurate uh, predictions. So I will give more detail later on, on how it works. Um, so the, but before I wanted to tell something else, so, um, Basically, the idea behind neural network uh, is quite old, so already maybe some something like 50 years old, uh, and also the basic technology about how to train them has been really developed uh, many years ago, but for a long time, the uh, neural network were, were just not powerful enough uh, to, to be useful. 
but um, and this was really the limitation was really the power of, of, of the computing power that is uh, needed. And of course, in the last uh, decades, the computer power has uh, uh, grown exponentially. So uh, this is basically governed by the number of transistors that we can put uh, in a chip. And uh, there was this very well-known empirical law, Moore's law. And so this has really grown exponentially. And so the transition between uh, uh, like um, neural network being just of academic interest and being not only useful, but even groundbreaking has happened really very quickly. And a milestone that uh, is widely recognized is this uh, uh, 2012 ImageNet competition. And um, this is uh, a competition where uh, uh, basically uh, different algorithms compete in the special task of image re recognition. They are uh, given uh, for training uh, like 1 million uh, human you, uh, anno images an annotated by humans, uh, and they should then perform uh, um, well in recognizing these images. And in 2012, for the first time, a neural network won this competition, and uh, from that day on, there was no coming back. Um, so nowadays, uh, we uh, use neural network uh, combined to other machine learning technique for a very wide uh, range of uh, tasks. So this is a, a slide that I borrowed for a uh, course that uh, Florian gave this semester. Uh, so if you want it's uh, available online, it's try to give an overview about all uh, advanced uh, machine learning techniques. Um, and uh, um, there are really a lot of application, both in technology and science, maybe focusing only on science, just a few examples. So for instance, machine learning, um, neural network can be used in, uh, uh, in microscopy. So one of the possible goals that I can have is to uh, be able to, uh, out of a low resolution image, uh, to uh, uh, predict a high resolution version of it. Uh, or maybe to accelerate the dynamic of uh, some uh, many particle system or to uh, recognize different phases of, uh, of nature or to find strategy to, um, uh, to control a quantum system uh, or um, uh, predict how different molecules uh, might um, react uh, and or maybe this is one this is one of the really the greatest uh, uh, breakthrough was uh, like this uh, alpha go so uh, um, uh, the um, so a, a, a so-called transformer which is like a complicated beast that as also as a, as a building block uh, and neural networks uh, has uh, been able to um, out, outperform all other approaches in, in the task of uh, predicting the uh, uh, form of the protein uh, if you're given the building block uh, that it's made out. Um, so I want to give just a few words to, to some further introduction how a neural network works. Uh, so as I mentioned before, it's made of uh, building blocks, uh, uh, these uh, neurons, and uh, they are um, it's structured in a series of layers, and uh, the different neurons are uh, connected in complicated ways, uh, but the building block is really very simple. Um, so the idea is that uh, from one layer to the next, the first step is just a linear transformation. Uh, and for this li linear transformation, basically, I just have to specify some, some, some weight and some bias. So um, this slope of the linear transformation and, um, and, and basically, it is a shift of the linear transformation. Uh, and these are the parameters that are going to be learned. And then um, to have something linear would not be uh, enough. Uh, um, 
at the end, one add also some nonlinear function. So an example could be like this sigma function, some kind of step function, but other uh, options are possible. And so the idea is always like to uh, combine a linear transformation with, a, with some very lean, very simple non-local uh, non-linear transformation. Uh, and the key point, um, okay, sorry, this shouldn't be. The key point uh, that um, I people try to achieve when they design this uh, neural network. So on one end, it should be expressive, so uh, it should be have enough parameter to to be able to um, basically by choosing the correct parameter basically uh, fit any function, and uh, also uh, it should be efficient. So it should be efficient to train. So at the end. Uh, what, uh, what to train, um, the idea is that one always define the cost function. So how far I am uh, from the prediction that I would like to have. Um, uh, and uh, then I do gradient descent. And the idea is that, uh, I, and so it's always, it should be always something differentiable. And also I have to be able to calculate this gradient efficiently. So these are the key point why neural networks are good. Uh, and okay, as I mentioned before, so nowadays uh, uh, the task that neural network are involved in, they go far uh, um, beyond uh, the, the simple task of image recognition. And, uh, um, and so for doing that, so the neural network is often just a building block of some more complicated learning uh, pipeline. So for instance, instead of directly predicting the label, I might predict some known operator that uh, then I want to further process doing uh, some other um, um, differentiable operation. So our work is an example of this approach. I will tell you more on this later. Or um, I can use neural networks in, in autoencoder architecture. So yeah, the idea is to, I have a very um, large multi-dimensional input, and I want to encode in a much lower uh, dimensional um, uh, feature space. Uh, and uh, um, I achieve this by uh, basically uh, uh, training at the same time an encoder and a decoder. Or another nice example are these of generative adversarial network. Uh, I have a generator that has to produce realistic image and uh, a discriminator, which is another neural network that uh, try to uh, distinguish between the images pro produced by the generator and the discriminator. Uh, and they are uh, trained together and uh, uh, the, more, the better the generator becomes, uh, the better this discriminator becomes. So they have this adversarial dynamics. So these are just some example, but the idea is that often these neural networks are just building blocks of, of a more complicated pipeline. Um, okay, so machine learning is something very powerful, but it's not uh, a, a magic bullet. Uh, so training is really complicated. So the training dynamics is highly nonlinear and, and stochastic. So it does not always work. Um, and um, uh, often, um, uh, so you have to really to understand, it's not a substitute for basic understanding, you have to understand what you're doing, uh, whether you're asking too much to your uh, neural network, and if you're applying in, this in physics, you have to understand the physics. Uh, and also like uh, the result depends on the, on the quality of, of the training data. So if you have just a few, uh, training data, so this is not the right setting for a uh, uh, neural network. And also another um, problem is that uh, often the neural network is more like a black box, so you get some result, and uh, but the interpretation is still uh, difficult. But still, it's, uh, it's fun and there is much to explore. Okay, so then I, I write to my own work. So the, the main motivation is that um, we want to uh, predict band structure, which basically encode all the information about uh, the transport uh, 
in a system uh, which is governed by a wave equation, and we are interested in engineer systems, so system where we don't have some God-given crystal structure, but uh, uh, rather, um, uh, for instance, a good example of this photonic crystal, one can um, really uh, choose how to engineer them and uh, for instance, in this case, by patterning some holes in, in a, the electrics lab. And the idea is that the, 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 the shape of the hole can be arbitrary. So we have really an infinite, an infinitely dimensional uh, configuration space, and we want to have a tool to be able to explore it uh, very quickly. Um, and uh, um, so this is our motivation. Uh, and uh, um, so the simplest possible approach that one could uh, have uh, is to, um, okay, wait a moment. No, I, no, I'm going ahead of myself. No, I wanted to mention before to uh, mention that before our work, there has been already quite a lot of effort in this direction, uh, but uh, with works predicting band gaps or also the full band structure or topological invariants, uh, but all the previous work had in common that um, they were uh, trying to start from a few geometrical parameters of the material. So for instance, in this case, the some radius of some hole and the distance between the holes or something like this. Whereas we uh, were the first to present a full approach uh, uh, where you, um, provide the, the geom, the full geometry, like an image of your unit cell. Um, and, um, okay, yes, and um, exactly, so this is what I wanted to say before. So there are, uh, uh, so the simplest approach that one could think is to view this as an image to image mapping. So I provide uh, to the neural network, the image of the unit cell and the neural network predicts uh, the band structure that can be viewed also as an image. And there are a lot of, this is a very uh, broad uh, field in, in uh, machine learning. Um, and uh, so it would have been natural. So uh, uh, neural networks are good in recognizing and, and processing images. Uh, however, we follow a different approach for several reasons. So basically, um, and I want to list them here. Um, so the one problem would be that if you would use this approach, then uh, you would basically discretize the quasi-momentum. Um, and uh, then you would have trained on some, uh, some discretized uh, grid. And uh, um, for efficiency reason, this grid would be a little bit coarse. Uh, and on the other end, there are a lot of very interesting sharp features like Dirac cones that would be difficult to, to capture. Uh, and um, uh, also often these, uh, these features are somehow encoded in the, in the symmetry of my system. And so this approach would be completely oblivious of, of the symmetry. And also I would not have any information about the block waves. And so I, would not be able to say anything about the topology. So my title is topological band structure. And as I will mention afterwards, the topology is something that is always encoded in the normal mode. So this is why we, we followed a, a different approach. And basically in our approach, uh, we do the following thing. So we use the neural network uh, to uh, define the free parameter of the tight binding model and then uh, we will use diagonalize this tight binding model uh, that is now uh, much smaller than the original problem. So this is a quite cheap operation and find the band structure. And basically the idea is that uh, we are, uh, then we, this was the most fu fun part of the work. So uh, uh, the, we put our own brain power in, in, in basically, uh, uh, designing this type binding model, type binding model that is uh, general enough. And this allows to account for symmetry and also to automatically enforce uh, a, a robust feature like uh, the raccoons. Um, and um, 
Okay, and then the idea is that each neural network that we train is uh, basically able to predict uh, the band structure for an Hamiltonian that is some sample from a distribution that where all the, the Hamiltonians share the same space group and the same symmetry class. And so basically for each space group and symmetry class, we have to think, so what is the, and then we, we need, we will have a different type of model of which we learn the three parameters and we have to think what is the, the most general type money model that allows me to predict any band structure. And we consider several examples, uh, actually three. Uh, so one was just the Schrodinger equation in 2D with, uh, in a setting where the time reversal symmetry is, uh, is preserved and we have the P6 uh, group. So just basically six fold rotational symmetry in a triangular lattice. Uh, and uh, also we consider a 3D example, even with a non-symorphic uh, uh, group. Uh, and then we uh, consider an example with uh, broken uh, uh, time reversal symmetry and uh, particle or symmetry. Uh, okay. So um, maybe a little bit more in detail how it works. Um, so the idea is that uh, we, uh, what we provide uh, to the neural network is the image of the unit cell, and then there are a series of convolutional layer, and uh, um, uh, basically these are layer where um, we have a very special ansatz for the um, for how the neurons are connected, and somehow in, in the, the goal is to have less parameter and basically explore the fact that uh, there is some, in images often there is some translational invariance. Okay, good, this is a technical thing. There are this uh, convolutional layer and then at the end this fully connected layer when all the neurons are connecting, uh, each pair of neuron in subsequent layer are, are connected. Uh, and, um, and then the output uh, are the parameter of this type binding model uh, and what is important, so during the training, we uh, do not provide only the band structure, but only the symmetry uh, levels of the block wave. So here the idea is that uh, we are always considering um, example where the, um, um, where the space group is non-trivial. Uh, and so at the, uh, there are some special, so in gen, and so it will have also some rotational symmetry uh, uh, and, um, in general, uh, when you, uh, um, for band structure, you're looking for solution that are translational invariant. And so they are not necessary uh, um, eigenstate of the rotation because the rotation do not commute with translation, but there are some special asymmetric point where they are. And so basically the symmetry labels basically tell us what is the behavior under rotation. So, so what is the quasi angular momentum if it's a rotation, for instance, if this transformation in space group are rotation. Okay, um, and uh, so how well it works. So it seems that it works quite well. So we typically, uh, we have like deviation of one per mil of the typical case. So in this case, we had some kind of stepwise potential. So it's 1% of the typical height of the potential. And it's really fast because this type binding model is quite small compared to, to the original problem we were considering. Um, and then also uh, we get very accurate prediction of the symmetry labels. Uh, and um, the idea here is just limited by the fact that, uh, uh, by the accuracy of, of the band structure. So if um, two bands are very close, uh, I, my accuracy will not be enough and I might swap them. Okay, so now, until now, I didn't talk about topology at all, uh, but the title, title is Topological Band Structure. And again, I wanted to give uh, a, a little bit of introduction about topology. Maybe I have to be a little bit fast because, uh, um, okay, I have 20 minutes left. Uh, okay, so maybe the most general, I start really from the basics. So, uh, uh, so you all know topology is an area of mathematics concerned with properties uh, that are preserved under continuous deformation. Uh, so for uh, oriented surface uh, uh, stretching and bending 
uh, but not discontinuous one like tearing or gluing. Uh, and so uh, for oriented surface, the, the basically the relevant uh, uh, topological quantity is the number of all, uh, whereas here we are interested in band structure. And then here the idea is that we have a system that has um, some kind of at least approximate uh, translational invariant, and then basically a, a very generic consequence of, and it's a wave system, uh, so uh, it could be some light propagating in the medium or um, the electrons that are that are like matter wave in quantum mechanics or uh, like some elast elastic wave. Uh, and the idea is that a very um, um, general phenomenon that I will have in a, in a crystal uh, um, structure is interference. And so very naturally the the spectrum of my system becomes divided in uh, allowed energy on band separate, separated by band gaps. Um, and, and then uh, in this context, topologies like I allow any perturbation of my Hamiltonian that does not close a band gap. And I ask myself which quantity uh, are relevant, are topological and robust. And um, um, okay, and then let's consider a very abstract situation. We have some kind of material and we plot its bulk band structure. It has a, it has a band gap. Uh, and then the idea of this topological invariant, normally they are property of the normal modes of the material, but they are revealed once I add uh, a, a physical boundary. So let's consider that now I consider a semi-infinite plane such that I still have some translational invariant in one direction and I can, can still pl plot the spectrum as a function of the quasi-momentum. Uh, so what could happen is that suddenly I have a state that connects the two bands. And this is something topological because uh, I, there is no way how I can get rid of it uh, with a continuous transformation. And what is interesting, if I have this kind of state, like as uh, described, as it's drawn here, you see I have just uh, the slope, which is like the speed is as always the same side, it's always positive, which means that uh, if I have some wave propagating along the border, it will move in just one direction. And uh, imagine now that the system is not anymore a semi-infinite plane, but just a finite system. Uh, there is no state, uh, the key point, there is no state can best scatter into. And so if I uh, uh, suddenly have uh, my, my edge finish, it should go on. So it cannot best scatter. And I can also arbitrarily modify the edge and it cannot be scattering because yeah, there is really no state it can best scatter into. Um, and um, so which means that basically it should be a property of, of the bulk. Uh, and um, okay, this was really a little bit uh, sloppy. Uh, if I consider really what, what kind of continuous transformation I can have, I can convince myself that I can always modify this, but the net number of edge states, so the number of left mover minus the number of right mover will never change. And this is related to the churn number of all the bands below the band gap. So this was for a system with broken time reverse asymmetry. Uh, it has been uh, uh, shown that uh, I can have this topological band structure always with, also with system with time reverse asymmetry. Uh, in this case, the simplest example is the material where I have uh, um, basically some um, spin one half particle uh, and um, um, in the simplest setting where I have uh, mirror symmetry, um, I uh, can, and I have uh, basically spin orbit coupling. And then in the simplest setting uh, where uh, I have um, mirror symmetry, I can think of each uh, spin as being like a churn insulator. So it's a very similar situation, uh, but uh, in a more general setting, uh, I, um, um, so I, I, this is described by a more, um, a different type of topological invariant, a so-called Z2 topological invariant. And uh, yeah, the idea is that um, I'm always 
interesting in system. This uh, can happen for system that has so-called Kramer's degeneracy. Uh, and um, uh, the idea is that if I have an state that connect the uh, two subsequent band, there is no way how, can, how I can uh, um, get rid of it. And uh, uh, so in this case, there are really just two situations, uh, either a trivial band structure or a band structure with an edge state uh, that connect the two bands. Okay, uh, and then um, um, uh, okay, then there is a more general. Uh, so this was very specific to to different situation, two D, uh, and uh, in, they were both in two D with time reverse asymmetry or broken time reverse asymmetry. There is a very general notion uh, to uh, define a, topo a notion of topology. Uh, and um, these basically uh, switch uh, from a picture of that treats uh, uh, basically the, um, the that uh, view the excitation as waves. And this is the standard approach where uh, I look for translational invariant solution of, of a crystal uh, structure and particular block waves to a um, situation where I view the excitation as particle. And basically here, what, I, what I'm asking myself, so, so for a set of bands that are connecting, uh, how can I express uh, the uh, underlying normal modes of the whole set of bands in terms of well-localized uh, uh, orbitals? Uh, and uh, in particular, I can ask myself the following question. Uh, is there an atomic limit? So can I deform the, the, the Hamiltonian to have orbital uh, with arbitrary uh, uh, small localization lengths? And uh, if this is the case, uh, uh, this is by definition what is called a band representation. And if this is not the case, I uh, will conclude that my band structure is, uh, that my uh, connected bands are topological. Um, and, um, and so the, uh, this is something very powerful because uh, for um, if I fix the, um, the space group, I can uh, view all these uh, bands that have a, an atomic limit as made out of simple building blocks. So this is the theory of, of band representation that has been developed by Zuck. Um, and um, uh, and basically this is what we have used also in our work uh, so we are ah, and okay and then what is important so this uh, for each of this building block I can uh, predict what are the symmetry levels and so basically uh, now we have used our neural network that is able to predict band structure and symmetry levels to uh, identify bands uh, that uh, are not compatible with a band representation, so topological band. Uh, and in this example, uh, the only type of bands were these so-called fragile topological bands. Um, okay, so basically this is the theoretical setting which is used in this topological quantum chemistry. Um, okay, so, um, and so this worked very nicely. So we, basically the idea is we, uh, um, we're able to uh, consider distribution of potential and to predict how many bands will be to topological and what kind of topological bands could be fine for the particular equation we were considering. Uh, okay, then I've mentioned that there is this C2 topological invariant for time reverse asymmetric uh, uh, system. Uh, and uh, in that case, so if I have inversion symmetry, I can predict it directly based on the symmetry label. So our system directly apply. So uh, with the limiting information that we have about the band, we can also predict the topological invariant. Uh, and then uh, the next step, uh, we ask ourselves whether we could use our method even to predict churn numbers. So this is uh, more tough because the churn number are not uh, symmetry uh, um, uh, constrained. So they are symmetry constrained, but they are not symmetry indicated. So the, uh, the, the symmetry puts some constraint on the churn number, but they, are, they do not allow, allow to predict them uh, uh, uniquely. 
uh, and so um, and so it's not clear whether our method works because after all we provide really very limited uh, information regarding the underlying normal modes to our neural network. Uh, but we basically we uh, had the idea to follow a, a, a strategy that at first appears to be naive, but it turns out it will work very well. So basically we train a handful of neural networks on the same bed structure. Uh, and then after uh, we have trained them and they're performing well on the, on the band structure, uh, we um, uh, use the, pre the, the predictive time binding models to calculate the churn number for a set of validation samples. And then we post select the best uh, performing neural networks. So this strategy seemed at first sight completely na uh, naive because we want to predict the churn numbers for uh, an infinite number of um, uh, possible uh, configurations, and we just can train a few neural networks. So how, how can it work? So the idea is that uh, there is some hope that it works because our neural network knows the band structure. So it, it already knows what it, what are the uh, basically the boundaries of the different uh, uh, topological phases, and the churn number are highly correlated uh, quantities. So if I if our, our neural network is predicting the right churn number for uh, just for one single uh, uh, configuration, a single band structure, it will automatically predict it for all the band structure within the same topological phases. And so basically, if I get the right result in all at, for at least one potential in all configuration spaces, I will be able to predict always the churn number correctly. And uh, then the only mistake will be because maybe the, the, the prediction it's not accurate enough and maybe I can get it wrong if I uh, have a band that it's close to the topological phase transition. Uh, and so we have tried this out uh, and we uh, uh, use basically this, one could try a different model. What we have used uh, is the following. So we consider a meta material that uh, uh, basically, uh, it's formed by periodic but random arrangement of two materials, and one of them is topological and the other is trivial. Uh, and we are interested uh, in the uh, band structure inside the band gap of the single component material. And yet, the physics is the following so we have some uh, edge excitation that uh, will uh, move and the interface of the two material. Uh, around the closed domain wall, but we'll also opt to neighboring uh, domain walls. And so this basically to the formation of a band structure, and we want to predict the churn numbers uh, for this uh, type of band structures. Uh, and uh, uh, we have also particle symmetry, so it's enough to predict the churn number for the positive energy band, and we will automatically get the churn number for the uh, negative energy bands. And here you see, I have quite a broad distribution of churn numbers. And um, so the upshot is that, uh, um, so it works as, as expected. Uh, so basically here are some results. So every dot is a neural network and they, uh, after training and uh, all neural network perform quite well, uh, equally well, more or less equally well on the symmetry labels. Uh, so on, on, on the symmetry of these normal modes, this is what they are trained on uh, and trained for. Um, uh, but uh, there are like just in this example, two, basically two types of neural network. Some perform equally well also on the churn number and some perform slightly uh, worse. Uh, and to confirm that the picture is really like we expect, now we exclude the uh, the samples that have um, uh, very small band gaps. Uh, and basically we uh, really see that we are up to 100% accuracy of in the prediction of the churn number. And uh, while it's not the case for, for, the, for, the, for the neural network that are not post-selected. So in this case, it means that basically we, we for some topological phases, basically the neural network predict the wrong churn number. Okay, so it's really possible using this post-selection to uh, use our method to predict the churn number. Um, okay, then the next interesting thing. Um, 
So we do not only want to, uh, so before the motivation, I was like, I want to explore this, this parameter space. And the idea is that like, what I really wanted to do is not just, you give me some random configuration and predict the best structure more the other way around. So you tell me, oh, I really want, would like to have a, some particular band structure. Maybe you might be interested not of the whole band structure, but on some details, it would be also possible. Uh, but okay, the idea is that you give me the band structure and uh, I give you what is the potential that produces the band structure. So how can I do this? So yeah, the idea is that uh, I have um, trained my neural network. Uh, so really now I have all the right weight and bios that I allow me to, to predict uh, the, the right uh, band structure. Um, and then what I do, I fix them now and uh, I um, take as a reward, I, ca I can decide for a reward. Uh, so some feature that I would like to have for my band structure. So in the simplest case, I want to reproduce exactly a band structure. And then I do gradient descent in the input. So in the shape of this uh, potential. And basically I, uh, in this way, I can start from, starting from a random potential, I can find the potential that give me the right band structure or the right feature of the band structure. So we have tried this by trying to uh, find the potential that uh, uh, give us the same band structure as some simple tight bonding model. And uh, so this is the dynamics during gradient descent. So we started from a very different band structure and then little by little by gradient descent, we arrive to the uh, right geometry that keep the right band structure. And uh, this is very fast. And so we can do it for uh, like millions of time. And uh, so for instance, in the example of this tight binding model, we had three free parameter and we ask ourselves, uh, so with our microscopic equation of motion, is it possible to uh, at all to, to uh, reproduce this band structure and basically you can identify in which parameter region you are the one inside of the blue region, you can, uh, you can have really a perfect match uh, of the uh, band structure that you wanted to have and the one obtained from, from the training potential. Um, okay, and this is really something it required to solve the the, the band such really 100,000 of time. And so it would have been really difficult to do it without the neural network. Okay. Um, so I hope I have convinced you that we have developed a very uh, powerful method. Um, it's very precise uh, and fast and uh, flexible. Uh, and uh, it's also suitable for optimization. So not only we can predict the band structure, we can also uh, like find desired band structure. And okay, until now we applied it uh, really to more toy model. Uh, we want to apply it also really to uh, finite element simulation of photonic and phononic crystals. Um, and uh, we are also interested in uh, like more uh, fundamental questions. So can we, uh, um, for instance, predict the band structure of, uh, um, of a finite site system uh, using a neural network that is trained only on, uh, on bad band structure and, and maybe something more about the, um, maybe providing it more information about the, about the um, uh, underlying uh, normal modes. Okay, so for this, uh, um, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Vittorio. <clears throat> we finished perfectly in time. Is there any question here from the room or should I ask online? Is there any question from the online people? Yes, there is a question from Etzolo. Uh, Etzolo, uh, do you want to ask live or do you want to type it? I'm trying to put you as a panelist, Etzolo. I 
but so you can ask live. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, okay, well, first of all, thank you for, for the talk. It was super instructive and, and very nice. So I have one sort of picky question coming from somebody from Photonics with me. Mm -hmm. You said okay. something about metamaterials, like that you were designing metamaterials or something like that at some point. And I wanted to ask you if you meant photonic crystals also for 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 that contribution or if yeah, exactly. Yeah, one goal would be to apply to photonic crystals. Yeah, that's right. Okay, 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 okay. No, it's a very I thought that you were applying it to metamaterials for real, but okay. No, I, no, no, I really meant like more like photonic crystals. And so you mean by metamaterial something where there is some active component? Uh, no, no, I mean a, a metamaterial is it has a unit cell which is way smaller than the wavelength of light. Mm, okay. So yes. in this sense, you would always be at the at the gamma point. And so the topology mm. of a metamaterial is something that some people explore, but is different mm. from the topology of a photonic crystal. So mm. Mm. that's why mm. I wanted to. Okay. No. Yeah. That's so. So we were more thinking about uh, yeah photonic crystal. I okay. use maybe this word metamaterial in a slightly <laughs> proper way. It happens, it happens many times in the literature, but it's very confusing for people who work in metamaterials <laughs> for yeah. many years like me. <laughs> so okay, I see, yeah. I just wanted to, yeah, to, to clarify that. And so uh, another question is that uh, I think in the next slide where you said uh, this thing about metamaterials, you said also something about positive bands and negative bands, like... Uh, like okay, there, so basically I was... Um, it was in this special yeah, setting where we were more things. So this year we wanted really to have some strong topological insulator. So we, had, we need either a system where we break time reference asymmetry or which has pin um, uh, orbit coupling, so a harmonic system. And so what we had in mind here uh, would be some- okay. Could you go back uh, full, uh, full screen, please? Oh, yes. Um, So yeah, yeah, I was a little bit fast. So you could think of two, um, two D like this type of quantum well material, um, and uh, which basically in the large wavelength limit uh, can be. Uh, so actually, what we what we simulated microscopically was, was like basically this uh, Ber Bernevik Yuxan model that described topological insulator, uh, and. Uh, um, Basically, we um, with different value. Basically, we um, our potential in this case is the value of the mass. So we have different value of the mass in the in the red and the gray regions, such that for one value of the mass we are in the topological region, and in the other uh, we are in the uh, trivial uh, region. And then this system effectively about the Fermi energy as a particle or symmetry. And so there are basically bands that are above the Fermi energy and bands that are below the Fermi energy. Okay, but this is not a photonic crystal. Then. This is not a photonic crystal. No. Okay, 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 excellent. And then one more thing that I that I could not understand very well is that when you use uh, your your neural network to to detect Chern numbers, are you finally using the irreducible representations of the high symmetry points, or how, how are you doing it? Are you using magnetic topological uh, quantum chemistry, or uh, no? With the Chern number, it works like this: that um, so we have this tight binding model, right? The, uh -huh. Our neural network predicts the tight binding model, and then by standard means we can calculate the Chern number for the tight binding model. Oh, and okay. then the question is: Will this Chern number predicted by the tight binding model really correct or not? Okay. So, so the problem is that we have uh, given it too little information in principle. We, we just know the symmetry and this is not enough to uniquely predict the, uh, the churn number. But uh, so on the, the good thing is like the churn number are highly correlated. And so it turns out that by post-selecting a good neural network, we were able to, to do this, to achieve this. Perfect. All right. So, okay, thank you very much for the very good questions and sorry that you. it was a little bit too for, for the good answers. <laughs> uh, thank you, Aizola. Any other question from, from the people in the audience here or online? 
if not, uh, I have a question for you, Vittorio. Yes. So when you do the, the reverse process, so you, you start from the band structure and you want to find what is the actual uh, structure of your crystal. Let's suppose that you want to do this for a photonic crystal. Uh, yeah, uh, for instance, this would be an application, yes. So, uh, and uh, let's suppose that you want to have a photonic crystal with uh, specific topological properties. Uh, would, would this uh, reverse path also telling you which kind of, ma of materials, or, or let's say which kind of materials you need to implement in your photonic crystal? Okay, so it works like this, that um, basically I would have, so the application, I cannot, okay, or at least we didn't try and it's not so, it wouldn't be very simple to have a neural network that predicts the band structure for any material. So typically the idea is more like we, uh, for instance, we want to work with experimentalists that always use the same material, say silicon, and typically they really use always the same material and the same uh uh, width of the slab that they are producing and so and then the neural network is trained on uh, predicting band structure um, uh, for different type of shape of the holes for your photonic crystal that's the idea and so you will not be able to to identify the material uh, okay more specifically let's suppose that you want to find something that has a c2 topological phase huh? Okay, well, okay. The for, uh, system is, is, is not trivial because you need something with a uh, special problem. Yeah, yeah. Is your yeah. narrow network say, say, say you something useful or not? Well, of course, I mean, I cannot uh, <laughs> introduce some physics that it's not there in the system, right? So uh, for a photonic crystal, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. As you say, so T square is not uh, minus one. And so I could have more like, this kind of, I call them smooth envelope <laughs> topological insulators. So this topological insulator that, um, I mean, they have some edge state and uh, uh, and they are robust only as long as um, you do not um, scatter to a different uh, valley or to a different, um, so I have Kramer's degeneracy effectively after that I've done some um, basically smooth envelope approximation that basically negate large uh, momentum transfer. So I could do this kind of things. Uh, otherwise I have to consider a different system. So for instance, in our paper, uh, we had this example of, um, uh, yeah, in principle to, we, we use it to predict uh, like materials that are made of two different type of quantum wires. And uh, so you alternate, so this is, um, um, yeah, so in this case, you could have some kind of top, really strong topological. Um, so yeah, the idea is that the red region is some topological insulator material and the gray region is different topological insulator material. And then there was this physics that, uh, yeah, you at the interface, you have edge state and I, I, but then I, since it's a periodic structure, I will have open between the, uh, different domain walls and this form of band structure. So okay, so the, like, sorry. Yeah. The idea is that uh, the approach should go beyond not, not just the photonic system, but any lattice. Yeah, system. no, no, it's completely general. So the photonic okay. system, it's just an example of. Uh, oh, so, so somehow, uh, if I can comment, uh, my impression is that usually people in condensed matter would solve the block problem. Then from the block, pro block, block problem, they would use a uh, uh, banalization in order to get uh, the effective, uh, the mo most effective tight binding model. That then is more or less what you are trying, what you are doing here with the neural network. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, maybe in a sense. Uh, yes, that's so. Yes. Um, so yeah, yeah. The idea is that uh, it's our attempt is to do it in a way that it's very general. And the all information that we put in is about the wallpaper group, basically, and and this um, um, uh, yeah, this generalized uh, symmetry, the symmetry, the so-called symmetry class. Uh, so uh, and so, in principle, it's a very general approach. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the idea. Excellent. Any other question from the audience online or the audience here in the room? Hi, there is a question from Camillo Tassi. Camillo, wait, that I, I allow you to, to ask live. Please go ahead, Camillo. Oh, no, so, sorry, I did that someone else.
Uh, Camilo, you can make your quest uh, live. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Thanks for the talk. And um, yes, I would like to ask uh, um, uh, if you use uh, uh, um, Keras library or, I don't know, a MATLAB library in order to implement the, the, the network. Yeah, so uh, we use Keras uh, in this. Uh, um, yeah, now we are doing some additional work with Photonic Crystal and we are uh, more using like TensorFlow. Um, okay. But yeah. Um, okay, thanks. So basically, in, uh, in our initial work, we um, also we have done by end this thing of like differentiating through the, there is this diagonalization part that you have to differentiate through. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, basically the idea is that um, there is a way to um, uh, to basically use perturbation theory to um, um, uh, basically to uh, write the derivative in term of the of the uh, normal modes that are. Uh, calculated numerically. I think this is also commonly used in all the method that use finite element simulation and combine them with gradient descent. And with TensorFlow, it's particularly easy because you can just say, okay, in, inside of TensorFlow, uh, it can really diagonalize through the. So uh, there are, so basically, um, um, uh, take the derivative through this diagonalization without doing extra work. So I think TensorFlow is, would, be, would have been maybe even better, but uh, at the time we did, we just used Keras. Okay, thanks. Do we have more questions? If not, I, I think that we, we can, uh, 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 thanks, Victoria, for the talk. And uh, if you have more questions, you can simply send me an email and uh, I, I will close here the, the session. Okay, thank you very much for having bye, me. Bye bye. Have a nice afternoon. Bye bye.